Hey guys, in this video I interview Chris Hinshaw, a former All-American swimmer and world-class professional triathlete. His top international finishes include multiple podium finishes in the world's largest Ironman races. He is the subject matter expert for aerobic capacity for CrossFit HQ, Mayhem Athlete, and has personally worked with more than 50 podium level individuals and teams. Chris and I talk all about things related to being a Masters athlete, including the differences between younger and older athletes, the reason Masters athletes are not as resilient as their younger counterparts. What we can do to slow down the aging process, common challenges and misconceptions with zone two training, what ingredients make champions, how to build mental resilience, and taking risks as an essential ingredient to being a champion. You can find Chris online at aerobiccapacity.com or his Instagram handle, Aerobic Capacity. And thank you, Mayhem Athlete, for allowing us to use the barn of all awesome places for this interview. I hope you enjoy it. This whole master's piece is, is a, a segment that needs to have representation based upon the age group. I agree. Why, why are CrossFit Games workouts not written by somebody in that age group? It is, it, it, that is a good point. Um, when we get to the games, um, you do find some of the workouts. And I felt this year at the, in the 45 to 49 year old age group, our workouts were appropriate. Yeah, felt like we had the right weights, with the right stimulus. Um, some we we kicked it off with heavy dumbbells. Mm. That were, I mean, seventy pound dumbbells for forty five reps. That was solid. It was really tough. Yep. But it wasn't impossible for us. Um, but then when you've got the fifty plus guys having fifty pound dumbbells, um, I know that's too easy for them. Right. The stimulus isn't quite there. In seven, right? Right. Yeah, the right. relative intensity from what you had to what they had. Yeah. It dropped off dramatically. Yes. Yes. And they experienced that in semifinals as well, where yep. we had a, a heavy snatch workout, yep. very heavy for us. And they had a, a max stamina snatch workout that was just a different weight load. And, and it was, it, it does make sense to try to dial that in a little bit more closely on those masters. But why is it that occurring? I mean, and, that, and that's my point is that if you are 40, for yourself, I'm 59. You have no idea what it's like to be 59. No. Right? It's like, it's like new parents. Are you a good parent? Are you doing How do you even know? Because you've never done it before. And so how could a 40-year-old know what it feels like to be 59? Right. They have no idea. And so that's why I think the same thing. It's like, I could program if I was in my 40s for you. But am I in touch with what Dave Hippen still can do? Right. And they're not. And that's the problem. So I think that's why we see dramatic drop-offs yep. or we see movements that maybe they shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. because you, they don't know about, you know, end of motion, you know, range of motion issues that they have. Right. Well, and that is one of the reasons I wanted to, to sit down and chat with you today. Uh, and this is the, this is, this leads us into that, that idea. Like what, in your experience, you've been in the CrossFit world for 10 years at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 2008 yeah coaching since yeah 10 years yeah yeah so you know we you've gotten to work with the best athletes on the planet right these the, the 25 year old best of the best and, and you guys and, and and us guys yeah i saw you i, I watched your stuff yeah. when we did that mile time and we yeah. did the 5k yeah yep. i'm very familiar with how good you are and it and what do you see as you know some of the differences between masters athletes in their capacity versus Younger athletes. Yeah, I mean, the, that's a great question. The biggest difference between a young athlete and an older athlete is their retention, their ability to maintain their level of fitness for a longer amount of time. So for myself, for example, if I take, let's say I get hurt, which we're more susceptible to getting hurt, right? Especially if we've done a lot of prior activities in the past, right? We're, we're, our, our, our ability to absorb volume um, is or intensity is limited because of that those prior experiences. But for me, if I if if I get hurt and I'm I'm taken out for twelve weeks, I start at zero. I start completely over. I lose everything. Mm -hmm. And so when you're younger, you retain those things um, a, a lot longer amount of time. And why is that important? Because you know what, most games level athletes they'll after the games they'll take most of August completely off. All right. Well, now what do you do? Are you going to do what and what I need people to recognize when they age is if you're not maintaining in those areas then you're running the risk of starting over yeah. and 
to do that year over year over year over year, like we've talked about before, that's a grind mm -hmm. to know that you have to rebuild because like you, you know what it takes to get to where you need to by the beginning of August. That's not that easy. No. And imagine redoing it, you know, Groundhog Day, year yeah. over year over year where you're starting from scratch. And that's the mistake I see masters athletes doing. Oh, I'm just gonna take four weeks off. Really? Why don't what you do is you just go out there and you maintain by just going slow. Don't target time. Just go out there and just move and maintain that foundation. Build a stronger structure. Work the bones, the ligaments, the tendons so that you could take on the pounding come April, May, and June. Went to the games in 2018, but I was so excited uh, following that year. I'm like, okay, I've got to go back and get on that podium. I was, was very excited. I went right back into training, maybe three or four days off, and, and that was fine. And I did that in 2019. I went and I won the games. And I just, I, I didn't want to take any time off. I went right back into things very quickly. With, and with what type of training? Though? Literally right back to whatever was programmed. Uh, in 2020, the, game, the games didn't happen for us. So there's this long stint of just straight, consistent work. And uh, what I realized is I was, I was on the threshold of burnout. Um, yeah. I was tired. I found after the games, after the training leading up to the games and competing at the games, my, everything was fried. Yeah. And I would say my central nervous system was fried. But I came back to just regular training standard, whatever was prescribed, I just did that. And I found myself to just be tired, exhausted, even though I was in, technically in the fittest shape of my life. Right. Then last year, I got hoodwinked into doing this half Ironman six weeks after the games by my son and a, and a good friend. They, they cornered me and I committed to do it. And it was the first time I had taken time away from a barbell off. But what I did during that time is I did primarily triathlon training with just a little bit of CrossFit mixed in yeah. to try to maintain. And I found that all of my achiness, the things that were bothering me leading up to the games in 2021, that some tendonitis going on in my elbows, uh, my lower back was tired, I had something wrong with my neck. Um, all of that went away because I wasn't doing the standard training that I do, but I was maintaining fitness, yeah, right. uh, big time, fit, I mean, on the triathlon side of things. Uh, and then this year, I'm getting smarter as I go along here. This year I did a triathlon. I wanted to have this committed off season. I want to have something, a goal like a, a half Ironman triathlon that forces me to do a different type of training that where I, I just don't have enough time to get into a gym or, or to be doing pull-ups. I don't have time for that. Right. But I combined mayhem bodybuilding with triathlon training and my body has never felt as good as it does right now. But why do you think that is? I feel like internally, um, one, I got a break. I, my, I got a mental break from the grind. And I don't, I love the grind, but I love it. I got a mental break. Um, my body physically, so when we're doing mayhem bodybuilding, I'm still squatting, yeah, right. still deadlifting, still pressing overhead, still doing bench, and I'm doing accessory work that I don't normally incorporate. So I ha it, it was hard work. I but finished these work. You eliminated Metcons. Yeah, eliminated Metcons. Right. And you replaced it with long and slow. Two hour, yeah, long and slow. And yeah. So it felt great. I feel great. So, but that's where I find it very interesting, right? Like you're, you're finding where you feel better. And is it because you created a better balance for yourself? I mean, how often can an athlete go in? Honestly, I mean, if you just think about it, you're going to go in today and you're going to crush yourself. By the way, tomorrow you're going to go crush yourself. The next day you're going to crush yourself. It's not a sustainable model. Right. You need to have a break. And so it's like what you're finding is a better balance. You're finding where, you know what? This balance is putting me into a better space. And I think that's what we have to realize. When we age, we're not nearly as resilient. And so we have to back off some to give the body a break. The question to you is, why aren't we as resilient? I, I knew Bill Walton, you know, was a kid and Bill Walton, you know, history of, of ankle knee issues. And he once told me as a kid, he's like, you know, you only have so many steps, hmm. which was really interesting what he said. I mean, I remember it, you know, even though I was, you know, preteen at the time, telling me that you only have so many steps. It's true. I mean, as we age, things change. For example, your VO2 max, right? your, your, your ability to breathe, bring in oxygen 
and use that oxygen in the muscles that are moving, it peaks around the age of 34, and you lose 1% of that aerobic capacity every year after the age of 34, mm -hmm. right? This is part of aging. We all know that our maximum heart rate drops yeah. by one beat per year, which imagine you're losing a percent off of your aerobic capacity every year. Same thing. Why do old people shuffle when they run? Why is it that, you know, the studies show that from the age of 40, from where you are, to the age of 70, your stride length gets cut by 50% mm. because you atrophy. And what atrophies? Not your slow twitch, but it's your fast huh. twitch, your lean muscle mass. So there's a lot of physiological changes that occur from about the age of 34. So you've been deep into it now for over 10 years. Yep. Yep. And these things, the only thing that you could do is slow them down. Huh. It's going to occur. My exactly. VO2 when I was you know, a professional triathlete was you know, one of the highest ever recorded. Well, it's still really high, but it's 20 points below what it used to be. And the only thing that happened was I got old. So we can mitigate it. You could slow it down. Slow it down. As guys are entering into their 40s, what can we do to slow it down? So there's three things that really you need to be thinking about. And, and two of them center around adaptations inside the body. First is the central adaptation, right? So the heart and the lungs. Yeah. By doing high intensity CrossFit workouts, the heart and the lungs don't know what the movement is. <laughs> they just know what the intensity is. Yeah. And so by elevating the heart rate, the more times you do that, it creates more efficiencies. Okay. And what it will do is it will improve the heart's ability to move blood, mm -hmm. meaning the stroke volume. Right. And that's a major limiter um, in VO2 max is the heart's ability to move that oxygen rich blood to the muscles that are moving. And so you want to make sure that you have a protocol of, of high intensity in there. Um, is there any age cap for that? Do we want to limit intensity at 65? Is there no, so anything? What we have to recognize is that the reason why old people lose skills is because they stop doing it. Mm -hmm. And we know that as we age, we know two major things that are going to occur. You're going to lose lean muscle mass and you're going to lose range of motion, mobility. Essentially, you're born in a ball and you're going to die in a ball. And what you need to do is you need to maintain that range of motion. And that's those two reasons are why you see older people shuffle yeah. because they can't generate the power and they don't have the range of motion. Right. So what I'm talking about is you need to be going in there and also developing this and maintaining it by lifting heavy. Hmm. I'm not talking about bodybuilding. What I'm talking about is, you know, Olympic lifting, yeah. working on your power. Hmm. That's what I'm talking about. And you need to maintain that. The other piece, though, is this, the, the peripheral adaptation. So okay. your limbs, yep. your arms, and your legs, we know that what we have to do is we have to maintain the peripheral adaptations to utilize that oxygen. What happens mm -hmm. is that oxygen, it goes into the bloodstream, and it goes to fuel those muscles that are moving by converting either a carbohydrate or a fat into fuel. Well, where that occurs is in your mitochondria. Yep. By doing longer, slower work, like you mentioned earlier, your triathlon work, that mitochondria, what it does is they multiply hmm. and they become bigger so that you could produce more energy. Now, why is that important? And that's just one of the adaptations and value for going longer time domains at easier intensities. I mean, the reason why that's important is because just like we said before, your VO2 after the age of 34, you lose a percent every year, but your maximum sustainable pace that utilizes that peripheral adaptation yeah. doesn't matter how old you are. Hmm. So if you train the long and slow, those slow twitch fibers and those intermediate fast twitch fibers hmm. retain the ability to maintain that maximum sustainable pace, meaning there's not a drop. Yep. It doesn't matter if you're older, young, man or a woman. If you train it, then you'll maintain it or even improve it. And this is our long and slow, like zone two type work. So zone two is a tricky subject. It for, is. It's a, I mean, I love that people are talking about it, but remember when we train, we're training the metabolic pathways, the energy systems, but we're also training the muscles. Mm -hmm. The muscles have to do the work. And so when we're talking about zone two, we're talking about heart rate. Yeah. Well, remember the major piece there is that you got to train the muscles to actually do it. Right. Right. Are you training the muscles to... Uh, hurt, meaning at a particular zone, Yes. at the beginning, it's a certain speed. And then as you progress through that zone two workout, 
as you become more and more fatigued due to muscular stamina, which is one of the purposes of doing zone two, yeah. are you maintaining that same heart rate all the way through? And what would your speed like be like at right. the end of the workout? You would start fast and you would end slow. So what did the muscles learn to do in that workout mm. by doing zone two? Mm. Interesting. And that's the problem when people are programming zone two and they don't know better, they think they're doing the right thing when in fact you're actually doing something counterproductive. Huh. Because the purpose of zone two is what? What we're really trying to do is target a low heart rate to create muscular stamina. Mm. So the way it's gonna work for you is that you're gonna go out on a zone two run and, and the brain, which is responsible for the recruitment of your motor units, right? Is the, the brain is responsible for the selection um, to match the amount of force. So it looks at your intensity and it's all, eh, this is easy. This guy could do this for an hour. Yeah. So it gives you just a bare minimum of slow twitch fibers. It would never give you fast twitch fibers that you use, you know, on a one rep lift because you don't need it. Yeah. Well, so what's going to happen is, is that you're going to then continue on your hour long run and those originally recruited fibers will fatigue and fail and the brain's going to turn those off mm -hmm. and now the rest of it. it will then recruit another batch of motor units, slow twitch, to allow you to keep moving. So those are the ones that are doing the work. Everything else is now resting. And that's why recovery is a major measure of aerobic fitness because mm -hmm. those original recruited ones are eventually going to have to go back in the game. Right. But what if they can't recover? Yeah. Yeah. Then they've tapped and they're out. That's a problem. That's why people don't have stamina. Mm. So what happens is, is that the brain has those now working. They're making you, allow you to move. Those fatigue and fail. They shut them off. They're now resting, recruits new ones. Eventually, you work your way all the way back around to the other ones. Yeah. The originally recruited ones. And here's where the dilemma comes in. What if they're not ready to go back in the game? What do you do? As a crossfitter, we always think that higher intensity is better, meaning I'm going to ignore my zone two and I'm going to maintain my speed, uh, yeah. and what I'm going to do is allow my heart rate to climb. Yeah. So they've turned a zone two workout into a progressive workout right. where it go, starts easy and it progressively gets harder and ends at maximal intensity, and they yeah. think that that's better because mm. it's CrossFit. Mm. But what's happening when that heart rate starts to drift upwards is that you just started recruiting fast twitch muscle fibers because you don't have any more slow left. Right. Right. You turned a slow twitch workout now it's fast twitch. And what did you teach those originally recruited slow twitch fibers in that workout? Don't worry, bro. We got your back. <laughs> right. You don't have to go back in. Mm. So Interesting. as a result, as a byproduct of that methodology, that approach, you just rewarded those slow twitch fibers by never going back in the game. You just defeated the whole purpose that the intent behind that was, I want them to go back in. My mm. purpose is I need to improve my stamina. Right. And what you're doing is, you're short-circuiting the, the, the intent of those types of workouts because you just didn't know. So I have, let's say, at the end of a couple workouts a week, I have 30 minutes zone two, and I'm doing it on the Concept2 bike, and I look forward to it. Which I'm really be paying attention to, to try to maximize, to not have that be a wasted half hour of time. I can hardly run and stay in zone two. If I start to run, the heart rate pops up. Right, just naturally. So the bike is a great way for me to stay nice and calm, nice and slow. But does that mean like I start to feel myself wanting this to, to bump it up? Do I keep it low? Do I keep that heart rate just where it's supposed to so be? Let's let that be my guide. Let's talk through the first thing that you said. Running, it's hard for you. Yeah. Why do you suppose that running's hard to do yet sitting on a bike is not? Because in running, you have to support your body weight. Yeah. Weight matters. Yep. Same thing if you have to ride a bike uphill, yes. the weight matters, but on a rower, in a swimming pool, and on a bike, your weight is supported by the object, so you're not penalized by it. Right. You know, it's interesting that there's all kinds of, like, quiet research being done by elite-level marathon runners where they intentionally dehydrate themselves mm -hmm. to lose body weight as they progress through the run, and the dehydration is less of a risk than the value of losing mm. 10 pounds of water weight. Right. Right. So that's interesting, right? Yeah. So that's why that it's more demanding. But keep in mind, everything that you do in the gym practically, you have to support your structure. Yes. So when you look at opportunity as far as valuing your time, if you can run, then why wouldn't you run? Because it's more transferable. Mm, I see. But yeah. now let's go back to the reason why um, it's hard to maintain that. Like what, what happens? 
when your heart rate drifts upwards mm -hmm. at that particular speed, so you're, let's say that you're averaging, and let's just pick a number, you're averaging two minutes per thousand pace on a bike or, yeah. All right, so that's your target. So you're just maintaining speed, 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 speed. And your zone two is, let's say it's a heart rate of 140. Yep. So you're at 140 and you're now maintaining. What will happen is you'll be somewhere 10 minutes in and you'll still be at that two minutes per thousand. And then you start seeing 142, 140. Just creeping up, absolutely. Right. Why is that occurring? Same thing. Your breathing rate's going to increase when that occurs, yep. right? Yep. Because your heart is trying to get more oxygen to the muscles. Yep. Well, that means the muscles demand for oxygen is going up, isn't it? That's why your breathing rate goes up. That's why your heart rate goes up. Why is your demand for oxygen in those muscles at the same speed going up? It's because you're having to recruit more muscle fibers, but more than likely, right? Yeah, it makes sense. More than likely, it's fast twitch. Yeah. So that's the predicament, right? That you are targeting that correct speed. Right. But unfortunately, now you just lost the targeted stimulus yep. by recruiting fast twitch fibers. You turned a workout that the purpose was slow twitch zone two, yep. and you turned it into zone three or zone four yep. fast twitch. You just ruined the workout. <laughs> but that's where people don't know. That's why having a coach, it uh -huh. really matters. Because there's so much misinformation, and it's not like I blame people. It's like it's confusing, right? It but is. you have to listen and look. The human body is logical. It's super logical. Yeah. Like, why are these things happening? And there's always a reason. But you have to understand some physiology and how, when we train, we train the heart, right? We train metabolic pathways, yeah. energy systems, but we're also really training. The muscles, right? The third piece is that neurological side. You know, I, when I was racing, I realized right away I didn't have a finishing kick. I didn't have sprint. If it came down to it, I'd lose. And I'd lose over and over and over again. And there wasn't an opportunity. Like we were talking about coaching, you know, like to have a coach. I had coaches. But there wasn't a way to, to cross-check information, to research your own piece, mm -hmm. to do a deeper dive, to better understand. And there certainly wasn't an opportunity to, to communicate with a coach. Like I had a coach that gave us 10 by one mile with an 800 jog in between on back-to-back -back days. <laughs> and none of us had the courage to go to the coach and go, you gave this yesterday. We just did it. Right. <laughs> <We're> just like, <laughs> I've done that. I mean, I've done that, but uh, I know, yeah. So there wasn't that opportunity. And, and I mean, I did, um, like high intent, like hill work and, yeah. and like working on my power output, you know, and I would do speed work on the track and all that, but I never went into the gym. I never went in and did heavy lifting. And the reason why is like, so I have biopsies in my arms, my legs to determine like, you know, my physiology and I have about 15% fast twitch fiber. Well, my events were nine hours. So like, the coaches just were like, just let's focus on what the event is. Let's train for the event. Yep. And the mistake was, is like, well, what about me, though? If you're just training for the event and not considering me, that's the mistake. Hmm. And there's, there's what, that's what's called an event-centered training model. Mm -hmm. It doesn't care who you are. It's just training for the event. Yes. Very specific. Very narrow. Yeah. Right. Like if, if you wanted to train for, you know, your, your half marathon in your, your half Ironman, what do you do? You just have more volume into your training and the body adapts that volume until your last workout is an unbroken half marathon. Yeah. That's how easy it is. Yeah. But it doesn't know about your history. It doesn't know about your injuries. It doesn't know about your experience. Nothing. Yeah. This is the holy grail in programming that mm -hmm. takes into account. And like, you know, when you did the mile for time program yeah. you know, that I wrote, yeah. that personalization is an athlete centered model. Yes. And I'm giving you targets based upon your results. Yeah. They're based upon you, yeah. nobody else. And so uh, I didn't get that treatment there. And when I would go and compete, there was a mismatch. Why did I lose every single sprint? Why wasn't I going into the gym and optimizing that 15% of fast twitch? Yeah. Why was I not doing it? Yeah. And that's where I look back on it as, as a coach working with you I don't want you to have any regret. And, mm -hmm. and so what I want to make sure is that you're not leaving anything behind. And that's why you want to encourage like what you're doing here, yeah. like communicating information 
because you don't want people in hindsight to go, I could have been better because that is a bad feeling. You know, I, I ran into you after the games in 2021. I, I bet I know your results better than you do. Yeah. Because it was a big deal. When it, you came up to me afterwards, yeah. I was like, I was so pumped for you because it, it wasn't like something that it caught you by surprise. Caught me by surprise. By surprise. Like I, to, to dominate. Particularly that four and a half mile event. Yeah. First event. Second event was deadlift and rope climbs. Third event is one rep max snatch. Yeah. My snatch is not, I can't beat some of these guys. Yeah. So I'm going to win this event. Yeah. I don't care. I come hell or high water. Yeah. And we run out the gate, the fastest 800 possible <laughs> into a four and a half mile as a buy-in to the rest of the you know, four miles. And, I, and, and we go in these big cohorts. So I know where my guys are. And I'm in the front of the pack. And Did you know? I mean, was it hard? to? Because I would have thought the way they commingled people, it, it would be hard to track. Yeah, it was hard because of the way they commingled. But I stuck with a small pack. And I knew who my guys were. And then one would fall off. Another one would fall off. And then it's just me and this guy right in front of me. And I stayed on his heels. It was five laps. Yep. And as I was going through the laps, someone telling me as I passed, like what my, my lap time was, my lap pace. Yeah. And it was way too fast on the first two laps. Yeah. But, but what are you there was do? no choice. Right, the guy in front of me would not slow down. Right. And so after the fourth lap, he, he, he backed off. And I just held my pace. That's the main lap. It, well, and I was afraid. I was like, he's, he's backing off because he's going to cool off. And then he's going to blow by me. That was what I thought. No way. So, <laughs> so I, I ran scared on, on the last lap. I ran hard. And with probably 400 meters left... I turned on the jets yeah. and I kicked it. I, when did you turn around to look to see where he was? Well, I couldn't. You just Did can't. you do it on the turn? I made it on the turn. That last turn, I glanced back and I couldn't, I just see a, a field. Oh, of right, because you can't get that. So he could have been right on my heel and I couldn't have seen him right. or he could have been a mile away. I just, and so I just go into the stadium and I run as hard as I can across that field. That I come up to you after, so I was like, I remember coming up to you and think, thank you for the running because I was prepared. I was over-prepared for the running. They could have put us in any running situation, in any endurance situation. Um, but it's not just the endurance that you're paying attention to with Mayhem that you're partying with. It's not just so I can run long. The training that you guys had us go through, um, I felt like my recovery was so good after each event. Because your recovery was better than other people. So I think what's appealing to me is that you said at the 800, like you knew your pace was too fast. Yeah. Just the fact that you know your pacing, yeah. that knowledge piece is a confidence boost because I guarantee most of the people that are in your age group don't understand in an event like that yeah. what their pace would be. Yeah. And imagine where you have that advantage yeah. of where is my limit. Yeah. The other thing is, is that in that fourth lap, like if you think about something, if you do a four laps around the track as fast as you can go, which lap? is the lap where you, you want to back off, where that doubt creeps in, where you say to yourself, man, if I don't slow down, I'm not going to finish. And everybody will say it's the third lap. Well, what if it's five laps? Right. Well, it always occurs in the fourth. Yeah. So what happens and what you should recognize in next time, if anybody slows down in that sticking round, right? Yeah. That's a sign that they're in trouble. Yeah. Because everybody... Everybody has that uh-oh moment in a workout, right? Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. And what I want you to think about is, like, if you imagine you doing four laps around the track, and where does it occur? The third lap, right? Yeah. Why? Why does it occur there? No, I just want you to let's slow this down. Why does it pop into your brain in the third lap versus the first lap or the fourth lap? Right. Why does your confidence, why does that, that sensation go away? Yeah. And what I want you to think about is the brain, which is responsible for the recruitment of the motor units, right? Like we talked about earlier, well, the brain's also giving you the sensation. So what I'm asking you is, what is that sensation? Why is the brain giving it to you right then and there in the third lap? Mm. Where it's saying, if you don't slow down, we're not going to finish. Right. This is where a coach comes in. When you interpret that, the brain's telling you, you're dying meaning you've gone into a non-sustainable pace. Yeah. And if you don't slow down and get below that maximum sustainable pace, you will die. Right. And so that's what that person did. Mm -hmm. That was an insight into their dying. Well, imagine if you're sitting there and you haven't felt that feeling yet. Right. So whoever triggers that first yeah. is the one that's going to lose. Mm -hmm. And that to me is what's yeah. so exciting about what you said is like, 
That's a real big tell. Yeah. And then that, that last lap was my favorite lap. Right. I'm playing mental games in my head yeah. in, in all of these events, yep, especially right. a long one like that. So mental. Is there a way to build resilience? How do we trick our brains into doing harder things? So it, it's interesting. Like when I talk to CrossFitters, the reason why they love Metcons is because they don't have to think. Mm-hmm. Right. When, when intensity gets so high, you can't think. Right. So meaning the, yep. what you're talking about is thinking. It's strategically thinking. It's called self-talk. Mm-hmm. Are you able to strategically think real time in a situation like that, yeah. right? To think tactically that you're looking at, and you see it all the time when someone is in trouble, they no longer go on a run from apex to apex and take the shortest possible route because they're just not thinking clear. Yeah. It's a sign that they're in trouble. That takes practice. And so if you're never going long, then mm-hmm. you're not going to develop mm-hmm. those skills because right. those skills need to be developed? Mm -hmm. Are you able to move in between thoughts of like, oh, my technique, oh, my pace, oh, my breathing, oh, my distance, Mm -hmm. right? Into maybe thinking something about work that you can migrate between these things. But your mental acuity, when you get into trouble because of fatigue, those things go out the window. Simple math equations. Like I had had a, a coach in college where we would do repeats and he would give us simple math problems. And it's hard. Like yeah. if it's, let's say it's, it's 2.37 in the afternoon and you subtract, you know, 47 minutes from it, what is the time? That's There's an, no way to do that math. <laughs> but those are very trainable. And, and we see this in CrossFit where they have not done enough volume. And this is where you're unique. The fact that you can do a half Ironman. I, when the Marathon Road got announced, weren't you surprised at the elite athletes, the men and the women, and the response that they had on doing a marathon, that it was an overwhelming obstacle. And all you have to do is just sit there. Yeah. It's what we're talking about, three and a half hours? Yeah. I mean, it's a joke. Yeah. And yet it was overwhelming to them yeah. because they hadn't done that before. Yeah. That was an unknown. Mm-hmm. And that's where I sit. Imagine if they gave a, a half marathon to the elites. That would be great. I, I agree. <laughs> but the question is, is, could they come back the following day? Yeah. Because I'm not convinced that many can actually do it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the problem is if you have not done enough volume, like mm-hmm. think about when you did Ironman, like negative thought propagates. Mm-hmm. And are you able to recognize it and control it so it doesn't take root? Like yeah. I remember, you know, the first time my toenails came off in mm-hmm. Kona and I feel I don't wear socks and I feel my big toenail float around in my shoe. And I remember thinking, that is so rad <laughs> that I literally popped my toenail off. Right. Like, I thought it was awesome. But imagine if I worked there, like, I have to take my shoe off and look. Right. And that's what I'm talking about. If you've yes. not done enough of that volume side of the equation, <laughs> then that unknown, yeah. your ability to manage self-talk yeah. is limited. It, it is interesting. During this half Ironman, it's a 56-mile bike ride. And I made a slight adjustment to my seat the week before the Ironman. Yeah. I just had some weird pain in, in my training rides. So I adjusted my seat slightly and I didn't tighten it. Oh. And I didn't have tools on me. I start this bike, I'm going up a hill and my seat rocks backwards. I was like, well, that's weird. So I grabbed the seat. Right away. I mean, this is four miles in. Oh, man. And I rock it back to vertical and I'm going you and it rocks forwards. 52 more. Uh, and now I've got this dilemma of what am I going to do about this seat? Because yeah. this seat is not stable. So if I sit right on the stem, perfectly balanced, the seat will not move. But it keeps tipping forward. If I lean forward, it right. tips backwards. If I want to sit up and open up my back, it tips backwards. Let's face it, you do move on that seat to change muscle groups. It's so frustrating, right? Yeah. Um, so on the, on the hills, I would stand yeah. to climb the hills because right. it just felt so much better. I would recruit different muscles, right. let uh, right. some nice muscles recover. But yeah. You know, I'm in this. I'm, gonna, I'm going three hours with a seat that's not stable because I'm not stopping. I'm so invested in this that I, it's fine. My seat's loose. Now, lesson learned, like tighten your seat. But I mean, that's, the, that's what you, so Michael Phelps coach, intentionally won, like yeah. practice goggles before yeah. a major event. And he ends up, you know, like adapting to that situation. Bad stuff happens. Yeah. And it, it never goes perfectly. And the problem is, is that in the gym, 
you're controlling all your variables and that's not real life. No. And sure enough, one time, you know, for the, the you know, gold medal, like another medal opportunity, he dives in and his goggles fill with water. Yep. Imagine, and, and it's easy to swim with the goggles aren't on, but you have goggles on with water in the goggles. Well, what if you've never done it before? Yep. And all you're dwelling on is that negative thought. Yep. And that's what I keep telling people. That's why you're a champion for a reason because you think differently. Mm -hmm. And that is why you're a champion. It's because you're looking at these nuances and asking these questions of like, is this valuable? Mm -hmm. and, and you're pushing yourself where others aren't. And that's why you're going to dominate because they don't know how to control this negative thought because yeah. they've never done it. Yeah. And that's what we have to put. I had the most, the, one of the toughest guys in the sport do around the Tahoe run. You know, it's 202 or 204 miles. Wow. And his better half called and said, you know, he's crying. Hmm. Like, totally normal. <laughs> totally normal. Totally normal. <laughs> yeah. But if you've never seen it before, yeah. and that's my point with yeah. you, is that you have such an advantage over competition that they can't manage thought as well as you can. Yeah. Because they don't have the experience in dealing with it. And I'm not talking about time. I'm talking about the layers. Yeah. Yeah. There's... It is interesting, and that's, I, I am constantly trying to understand when I have four, five, six other guys that do the same training that I do, yep. that are in my cohort at the CrossFit Games, why am I dominating that, that area? And, yep. um, and it is this outside the gym, this layers of thinking, knowing my body. You know, Bill Grundler was commentating on one of the workouts. It started with 20 ring muscle-ups, and I gambled. I'm going unbroken because the rings were swinging. It was windy. And I didn't want to deal with any of that. I wanted no mistakes. And I knew that if I could get 20 done, I win the event. Yep. I win the event. No one's catching me. And I was at you know, 17 and it was a tough lockout, 18, 19, 20. And I, I was not missing a rep. I got him locked out. It made it happen. And Grundler on the, on the, he, he said, you know, you, you have to know your machine. And I knew on my 18th rep, I'm good. I mean, I, I, it was a tough lockout on 18, but I was like, oh, I know I have two more. It was just that, that confidence, and I knew my machine. And I do the same thing on a lot of the other workouts. You but know, I, also, I also, though, think that the reason is, is because you take risk. I mean, how many of your competitors take risk at, at, at doing an, a, a half Ironman? Yeah. Uh, how many of them actually do that, like, that seek me out? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, like to 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 want to learn and to ask these questions. Yeah. How many of them actually actually do that? And and there's no one in your age category that does what you do. And that's what I see all the time. You're always taking this this element of risk, whether it's in a workout, doing future events, communicating with people. Yeah. It takes some courage. Yeah. It does. Yeah. But that's what gives you this competitive advantage. That's the big deal is like you did a, a, you took a massive risk. Like we saw that from Ricky Garrard this year. Yeah. Ricky Garrard this year took risk and sometimes it didn't work. Yeah. But he had to do it. Yeah. Yeah. He, gave he it had to do it. Yeah. And so now like you look at him and it's like, wow, if he didn't make that mistake and that mistake and that mistake because of the risk he took, yeah. he could have maybe won. Yeah. And that's what you're doing. Yeah. If you always play it safe, then why are you surprised that you got second? Right. And you're, that's, you know, I always tell people the biggest difference between a champion and someone who, you know, finishes that champion, they want to do what others aren't doing. Mm. They want to do something extraordinary. They want to take yeah. risk. And if that risk kicks them out of the sport, that's okay by them because they don't want to finish second. And that's what you're doing, but oh, you're doing thing. things, but you're doing things yeah. that others won't do. Yeah. And that's why you win. Yeah. And you know that when it goes up to the line, you're looking across and you're going, you know what? None of these people did what I did. Mm -hmm. I, I, I earned first place. That's why I always say to people, it's like, you got to have some courage to take that risk mm. because that, that risk is what's going to give you confidence. Yeah. That's what you have. And what's great is, is that when you take the line, they don't even know what you feel. You're the one that looks back on them. You know, I had a friend once, he's, he has an IQ, it's IQ 178. And this friend, I said to him, he said, what's it like to be so brilliant? He's all, I'm not, I'm not smart. He's mm -hmm. just, and I'm like, what are you talking about? Your IQ is 178. And he says, no, I, I'm not smart. Everybody else is just dumb, <laughs> right? He sees yeah. himself, and that's what you yeah. see yourself yeah. as normal. Yeah. But everybody else looks up to you. 
And that's, that's power because you take these risks and they don't have that courage. When they do, that's when the playing field gets leveled. Yeah. And that's what you're always doing though, is that you're looking for the next thing. Yes. And that's what the greats do. Yeah. That's what Rich does. Yeah. I mean, to think that Rich reached out to me for help after he walked in triple three. Yeah, amazing. To, to own what you did yeah. and just say, I don't know. Can you help me? Yeah. How many people actually are willing to acknowledge that they don't know? Right. And you're a four times champion. The yeah. best ever that there's yeah. ever been. Yeah. And that takes some risk. Yeah. And now look at him. I mean, what is that? That was in 2014. That was in 2014. Right. The fun story behind that is that that was my first year doing CrossFit. Whenever I start doing something new. You're 10 years in, right? I'm nine years in, nine. technically. Nine years in. So is this 10 years? Yeah, it'll be 10 years coming for 2023. 20, so I was watching the CrossFit Games secretly on my phone on ESPN because I didn't want people to know how into it I was. And I watched Rich battle back on that last day and win. You know, his fourth yeah. title. Sean Woodland, the, the fittest man in history, right? Yeah. Incredible. And last week, I was on a podcast with Sean Woodland. Yeah. The voice that announced Rich, I was on a podcast with him. Yeah. It felt really cool. Yeah. And I'm sitting in Rich's gym barn, like right now. Like yeah. the process of, of getting here and, and all the steps. Um, and yeah, there are little risks of so just reaching out and asking for help and asking for guidance along the way has led to, I'm, I'm, I am starstruck. There's no doubt I'm starstruck sitting in this place. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, me too. You know, okay, yeah. I have people prove my messages back to Rich. You're like, I don't want to sound like a knucklehead. Exactly. Right? exactly. You, know, like you work with him, but it's like, you want him to like you. Exactly. <laughs> That's it's, so funny. You know, do you mind if I do an interview with Chris Hinshaw <laughs> in your barn? Yeah, that would be fine. Okay. Okay. That's what we're doing then. Oh, that's great. Well, Chris, thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate your time. I appreciate it too, thank man. You. Yep. Good luck to you. One particular thing I like about this ice bath compared to taking an ice bath in a, in a bathtub or in a tub, which I've done in the past, is um, you sit up in this thing. And so I can breathe. I can breathe really well as I'm getting in. And while I'm in here, I can really focus on breathing. I've worked with Ice Barrel to get y'all $125 off so you can try it out and see if you like it as much as I do. I threw a link in the notes below. You can go to icebarrel.com forward slash Jason grub and use code Jason grub to get $125 off ice barrel offers a 30 day money back guarantee and hundred percent satisfaction. And again, that's icebarrel.com forward slash Jason grub. Use my code Jason grub to get $125 off, get colder, feel better. And let me know what y'all think.